Do you think our system is capable of holding Trump accountable? And why is it so hard to find accountability for such a significant series of crimes? I think it isn't that hard. I fought to indict a sitting president, Richard Nixon. I fought to indict a president who had just resigned. And there's no reason why a former president gets any special benefit. When the evidence is clear, and I, I can hear Joyce in my ear saying, not really, not literally, but just in my mind, I can hear her saying, <laughs> we have to be careful that there might be something exculpatory we don't know. And that's true. We only know what's public. And what's public is very incriminating. Mm -hmm. It proves a crime. <clears throat> but there could be something we don't know. And the standard that the Department of Justice has is much different than what the committee has. The committee had to prove to the American public how they should vote, how they should think about this. But in a trial, you have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You have rules of evidence. You can't use uh, hearsay. So a lot of the mm -hmm. testimony that was so compelling was hearsay. Cassidy Hutchison saying, I you know, was told by Ornato that this is what happened. That's hearsay. So right. that's not admissible in a court. So we have to keep that in mind. But yes, this is a case that calls for accountability. And if we're ever going to stop this from happening again, we need new laws, including, uh, mm -hmm. thank, thankfully, the Electoral Count Act so reform, but more. All right. So I, I know I said this was going to be an all-skate question. It's not, because there are two really big questions I have to get to. But, Joyce, your name was invoked on this particular question. Uh, you, what, what do you think about you know, why is it so hard to hold uh, Donald Trump accountable? And will he be held accountable? So I think it's difficult because of the fear of becoming one of those countries where politics plays a role in the criminal justice system. We don't want to become a banana republic where former leaders are routinely indicted. But what Trump did is not routine. Insurrection isn't and can't ever become routine. And I think we've evolved now to the point where the criminal justice system is on the right track to hold Trump and those around him accountable. You know, Jonathan, something I think about increasingly is DOJ has done such a magnificent job of committing to prosecute virtually everyone who crossed into the Capitol on January 6th. They have prosecuted those people for relatively minor crimes up to the more serious ones. And now we're seeing the seditious conspiracy trials ongoing with some of the militias. We need that same sort of commitment at the upper levels of what occurred in obstructing the transfer of power in 2020. And everyone who was in the White House, who was around the former president, who was involved in obstructing the certification of the vote on January 6th, or in criminally perpetuating the big lie, all of those folks need to now be held accountable, just like the people who overran the Capitol. Barbara, there's speculation Mark Meadows might be cooperating with the Justice Department who do you who do you think uh, are potential key cooperating witnesses and why? And I mean, do you think that speculation about Mark Meadows is right? Does that is that what your gut's telling you? Jonathan, it's hard to know, and certainly that's the kind of thing that the Justice Department will really want to keep under wraps because they wouldn't want anything to happen uh, to him to cause him to be intimidated or somebody to try to get to him and tamper with him. Um, but it is a possibility, and he would be such an important witness. As we just said, his name comes up again and again in these witness transcripts. He was present for all these meetings. He was the gatekeeper at the White House. And so I think if Mark Meadows were to testify, it would be incredibly valuable for the Justice Department. But I don't know that they need it. Other potential cooperators, John Eastman, Jeffrey Clark at the Justice Department, either one of those could be very important. And remember, the Justice Department has tools that were unavailable to the January 6th committee. Search warrants would save views to, to get phones for some of those uh, suspects. Uh, they can put people in the grand jury. They can immunize them. They can compel their testimony. And so um, it seems to me that the Justice Department is going to be able to do even more than the committee has already done. Uh, Kimberly, I know you were nodding in agreement when when Barbara was was speaking. What do you think? Do you think Mark Meadows is is a cooperating witness, or who else might be cooperating? Yeah, I think. It's
it's really difficult to know because we have seen uh, such fealty given by people inside Donald Trump's inner circle all the way to the end, all the way until they themselves face a potential criminal liability. So I'm not in Mark Meadows' head, and I can't say for certain how far this has gone. But what I will echo is an important point that my sisters made, is that the DOJ, it's not like the DOJ was waiting for January 6th to finish their work. They have been carrying on this investigation, first by Attorney General Merrick Garland and then by Special Counsel Jack Smith, really seamlessly and very thoroughly. They already asked the committee for a uh, testimony, for example, before the referrals even came out. So to think that they are not doing everything they can, crossing every T and dotting every I and working very carefully, knowing how sensitive this subject of this investigation is, uh, I think that would be underestimating them. So whatever they're doing, uh, they are following, uh, the, they are, I, I would think that they are on path. And I haven't always said that. I've been critical mm -hmm. of the DOJ. So uh, I think th the evidence is clear that they are moving in a very, very, careful strategic way. Mm -hmm. You called the updates to the Electoral Count Act, quote, an important step to ensure we strengthen our democracy and the presidential certification process. Help us understand what these reforms are. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on, Jonathan. Happy holidays to you. Uh, you know, just like with so many other areas of our democracy, the Trump presidency was like a stress test for our systems. And we found where there were gaps or things that needed to be clarified. And in this case, we had a law from 1887 that had some terms that were vague or were open to interpretation and that needed to be clarified, basically. Now, some of them you might say unnecessary to clarify, like the fact that the vice president can't just declare who the winner of the election was. But we went ahead and did that. But I think really importantly, it raises the threshold to lodge an objection. The old law, uh, the 1887 law, was that you, if one member of the House and one member of the Senate objected to a state certification, <clears throat> then we would have to go to a joint session. But that raised it now to one-fifth of both member, uh, members of both the House and the Senate. I think that's really important. In, in a recent interview, your colleague, Congressman Jamie Raskin, who served on the January 6th committee, called the reforms, quote, necessary but not remotely sufficient. What's your response to that? What more could be done? I love Jamie. And, you know, I think what Jamie's saying there uh, is that this is not it. This is not where we can end, that we're not safe now that we've passed this reform to the January 6th process or to the counting of the Electoral Count uh, Act votes. We're not, our work is not done here because the, the next attempt to overthrow an, an American presidential election is going to look different than the last one. You know, in, in the next case, Jonathan, Kamala Harris is going to be sitting in the vice presidency, regardless of who the winner of that election is. So it, obviously, it's not going to have the same context around it. And we mm -hmm. need to you know, be aware of what's happening in the states, like my state here in Texas, where you're we're passing uh, you know, voter suppression laws that are making it more difficult for us to have an accurate reflection of our electorate and other creative attacks that they're going to find to try and attack our democracy. So we have to be prepared for that. I think that's what Jamie's saying, is that just because we mm -hmm. passed this doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. Mm -hmm. Let me play you comments from Republican Minority Leader, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in regards to the Electoral Count Act. Congress process for counting the presidential electors' votes was written 135 years ago. The chaos that came to a head on January 6th of last year certainly underscored the need for an update. Nine Republicans in the House, 18 Republicans in the Senate ultimately supported this legislation. President Trump, of course, has condemned McConnell and those Republicans for supporting it. And I'm just wondering, might Trump's grip on the Republican Party be weakening? You know, I've learned uh, not to really comment too much on, on you know, Trump's grip on the Republican Party. I think that there are certainly senators, in particular Republican senators, who know how dangerous Trump and Trumpism is not only to our democracy, but also to their political prospects, Jonathan. And you have to continue to remember this. In the last three American elections, we have rejected Trump or Trumpism from 2018 to 2020, and now in 2022, where we had a historic overperformance for the party in power. And so Mitch McConnell knows that as well. I don't want to, you know, assign too much in terms of you know, him having a, an awakening on, on who Trump is all of a sudden. Uh, I, I think he's always known who Trump is. 
But I also think he's seeing the election results and saying, hey, listen, we lost Georgia. We lost Pennsylvania. Uh, the governor in Wisconsin got reelected. You know, they're, they're looking at these results and saying that's going to make it hard for us to ever be able to hold power. Mm -hmm. We lost Georgia twice, <laughs> is what Mitch McConnell is thinking. Congressman Colin Allred of Texas, as always, thank you for coming to The Last Word. On the heels of some blistering midterm election losses, Republicans are turning to an old tactic, the culture wars. But this is Donald Trump's Republican Party. And in Donald Trump's Republican Party, you don't have to be subtle. And right now, it seems there's no bigger right-wing boogeyman than LGBTQ Americans, especially if you're Fox host Tucker Carlson. On his first show after the Club Q shooting in Colorado last month, this is what Tucker Carlson's viewers were subjected to. A screed filled with lies about queer folks sexualizing kids. Grooming is the phrase deployed by the right-wing. Now, this week, Fox released an edition of Tucker's streaming show with an interview featuring a woman named Chaya Rachik. She's behind the hate-filled social media account called Libs of TikTok, which traffics in all kinds of hate towards LGBTQ people. Um, and it doesn't matter what she says, because we ain't playing that. But without any pushback, Rachik lashes out at queer Americans with a string of vile, bigoted lies and insults. And Tucker Carlson calls her brave. He calls her a journalist. He calls her amazing. And Tucker's bosses at Fox let him do this despite the fact that LGBTQ Americans are facing a surge of hate speech, a growing number of armed protests at events featuring drag performers, and violence, all too frequently deadly violence, at a much higher rate than non-LGBTQ Americans. Joining us now is Congressman-elect Robert Garcia, Democrat of California. When he takes office next month, actually in five days, he will be the first out gay immigrant in the United States Congress. Congressman-elect Garcia, thank you for coming to the show. Talk from your own experience about just how dangerous what Fox and Tucker Carlson are doing really is. You know, I mean, that, that, first of all, that show was completely insane. I think you have uh, clearly not just Tucker Carlson, Fox News, uh, you have folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene constantly attacking uh, the LGBTQ plus community, attacking trans people. And it's really a shame what they're doing. There's no question that uh, gay Americans, LGBTQ Americans are being attacked more today uh, than in recent times. I mean, you look at uh, what the Republican Party and Congress is doing right now. They can't even take a basic, simple vote to allow gay people to be married. And so what's happening is really shameful. And it's being led and started by Donald Trump and now uh, all of his lieutenants in Congress. And I think that folks like Tucker Carlson should be ashamed to have those guests on his show saying those types of things. And as you know, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is launching an investigation into, into a Christmas drag show in Fort Lauderdale that his office alleges was, quote, marketed to children. But the venue that held the show said, quote, admission was limited to patrons 18 years or older unless accompanied by a parent to ensure patrons were aware of the adult themes and content in the show. This information was on the website and ticket purchase page. All ticket buyers were also informed directly through a no-before-you-go email. So, Congressman-elect, as usual, the truth doesn't matter. Absolutely not. I mean, listen, um, there's no question that Ron DeSantis, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Donald Trump are all more dangerous uh, than your local drag queen and drag queens in this community. It's, it's completely ridiculous that the bullying and the attacks are happening on the drag community, on the trans community, on those that are marginalized. It is just straight out bullying. And they're trying particularly to attack people that are vulnerable in our community, that need our support in our community. And this has become more and more common in the Republican Party for those in Congress, um, to folks like Ron DeSantis out in Florida. And so as gay people, as, as part of the community, we also have to be vocal, loud. We've got to stand up. We've got to push back and, and really you know, call them out uh, for, for all the lies that they're telling, for, quite frankly, trying to scare the community into moving us backwards. It's, it's not acceptable. Well, when you get to Washington next week, you will be a full-fledged member of Congress. What do you want to do once you become a member of Congress? 
Well, first, I'm going to work every single day to ensure that our community is not attacked. I mean, this, this attack within our community uh, is disgusting, and so I plan to be a voice to push back. Um, and beyond that, we've got to make sure that we take uh, the uh, the offense to, to, the, to the Republican Party as it relates to civil rights, as it relates to marriage, as it relates uh, to supporting our community. And that's, that's something I hope to do every single day, besides really engage on the big issues facing us today, whether it's immigration, whether it's uh, progressive taxation, whether it's making sure that we're pushing an agenda forward that actually includes all of, uh, all of the country, not just some. I'm not just selected few. Um, that, that's what will be important to me. I'm excited to get to work uh, this upcoming week and look forward to welcoming our class in the Congress.